First of all, you see all this magnificence. This right here is the official OTR Essential t-shirt. Get yours now. Hashtag buy a shirt. Click on the link for the OTR Essential store at Pro Wrestling Tees and do it. Do it now while you're watching this review. And if you have any thoughts or suggestions for the next old school wrestling show that you would like me to review as part of this retro wrestling review series, leave it in the comments section down below. And thanks to some of you, and fuck you, I now have to review TNA Victory Road 2009. So, thanks to a lot of you, I had to go back and watch this show for the first time in eight years. A big hearty fuck you to those of you that voted for this. This is one of those legendarily terrible shows that a lot of fans believe, and probably rightfully so, it belongs on TNA's Mount Rushmore of shittiest of shitty pay-per-views. And, and don't get me wrong, this pay-per-view was really, really bad. And really bad to go back and watch again for the first time in eight years. But the interesting thing to me is, based off of that company's history for all of those years, number one, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say this is the worst TNA pay-per-view of all time. Number two, I'm not even sure if it's necessarily the worst TNA pay-per-view of 2009. That's not to say that it wasn't terrible, that it wasn't horrible, and I wasn't cursing the lot of you that voted for this crap as I went back a couple of days ago and actually sat in one sitting and watched the three hours of this shit fest. Because it was bad. It was really, really bad. But I think sometimes our memories kind of deceive us a little bit. And I ask that everybody kind of pump the brakes a little bit. Because number one, this did not have the worst wrestling match I've ever seen didn't even have the worst TNA match I've ever seen and it most certainly to me was not the worst TNA pay-per-view of all time so let's go ahead and talk about this steaming pile of dung that was TNA Victory Road 2009 and you kicked right off with the poster girls for the event the beautiful people in this case Angelina Love with her cohorts Velvet Sky and Madison <laughs> Oh, good. It's been a while since I said that. Challenging Tara for the Knockouts Championship. Now, of course, as is so often the case, when you deal with a Vince Russo book show, you had a title change on TV just to go right back and change the title back on the pay-per-view because Russo gonna Russo. Now, the match itself started off okay, and honestly, it might be either the best or the second best match of the night and believe me, that's not saying much. And really, frankly, that's not saying anything. It was going okay until we have the spot where Velvet Sky tries to spray Tara in the eyes with hairspray. And of course, it gets an Angelina Love's eyes. Ultimately, it doesn't become an epic backfire because that's not the finish to the match. Instead, Angelina Love ends up pitting Tara. Tara gets her foot on the ropes. And of course, the ref magically doesn't see it, to which then Tara gets pissed and places the tarantula on Slick Johnson. And he just sits there quivering and shivering this entire time. Like, dude, you are a fully grown fucking man. This is, even though it's a tarantula, it's just a spider. Get up and dust yourself the fuck off. It was just an early indication of how squirrely, screwy, and stupid this whole pay-per-view was going to be. And after this knockouts title match, instead of doing what normal companies would do and maybe sitting there and giving you what the match card is going to be for the night before the show begins, Don West, Mike Tanay, after one match has already taken place, we get a reminder of literally just about every single match on the damn card, which was just really odd and really strange. And the last thing I freaking needed was a reminder that I was going to get a whole bunch of main event mafia bullshit throughout the rest of the pay-per-view. Matt Morgan versus Daniels is a perfect example of just because guys are polar opposites on the size spectrum and in the style spectrum, that doesn't mean that the match is automatically going to be good. Sometimes styles make fights or matches and sometimes they ruin them. And as much as Daniels was trying here and he was bumping for Morgan and doing all of this crap, the fact is this match just didn't really resonate. It just didn't connect. It just frankly wasn't any freaking good. And with that said, as I watched that match, it just kept coming back to me that of all the stupid shit that this company did 
one of the guys that they screwed up the most was Matt Morgan. He didn't have to be great in the ring. He didn't have to be this. The dude was seven foot tall. He was the blueprint, the DNA of TNA. And I think about when Hogan came in in 2010 and they used kind of that senior buddy system. Who in the fuck looks at Hulk Hogan and says the natural alignment of order here should be that he works with fucking Abyss. Hogan should have been aligned with Matt Morgan. What was really ridiculous after all of this, all the crap with the main event mafia, Matt Morgan trying to get in and he ultimately doesn't and then he turns face, is that this guy should have ultimately been at least once, if not several times, the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. When you look at some of the busters and buttons and washed up asses that had that belt, Matt Morgan was sitting right there so glaringly obvious Put the world title on me. Put the world title on me. I might not be great, but I'm better than some of the others, fucks. I promise and guarantee you. But of course, this company was too stupid to realize that, and it never happened. So we get to Dr. Stevie and Abyss. And this ended up being a no disqualification match because somehow, magically, Dr. Stevie had matchmaking and stipulation making powers. How did he have those powers? We don't know, and nobody ever bothers to answer these type of things when it comes to TNA, especially in 2009, because again, Russo gonna Russo. And when it comes to this type of match featuring an Abyss, if you've seen him in an ODQ match once or a Monsters Ball match once, you've seen them all, which is predominantly about 80% of Abyss's freaking matches. And then, of course, you get the whole stupidity of the taser and the taser freaking spoke. <laughs> it was a mediocre to bad match with a ridiculously hokey, bullshit, phony ass fucking finish because, again, Russo's gonna Russo. So after that waste of space of an ODQ match, there's Mick Foley rallying the troops, beer money, AJ Styles, and watching it the whole time, you're just overcome with a feeling of depression looking at Mick Foley in a place where he clearly doesn't want to be, doesn't care to be, and doesn't need to be. After that backstage segment, we got a special treat. British Invasion versus Team 3D for the IWGP Tag Team Championships. Yes, of course. I know the Dudleys were the New Japan Tag Champions at the time, but ultimately, here's a TNA pay-per-view. Let's go ahead and defend the New Japan Tag Titles here. And as far as the British Invasion goes, he should have been called Brutal Magnus. He was greener than goose shit. He was awful. He was terrible. This match was bad and sloppy and kind of a clusterfuck. Then the referee is taking forever to mess with the freaking table. Like, how long does it take to fold the table back up, you retard, was what I was screaming the entire time he was fiddling with it. Like, Jack Swagger looks at that based off of his history of being unable to unhook the Money in the Bank briefcase at WrestleMania 26 and says, dog, furry fat off. This looks like shit. I mean, Jesus, this was a bad match with a dumb finish. Because, again, Russo's gonna Russo. After this, we get an interview with Slick Johnson. Not asking him why it would take anybody that freaking long to try and fold up a freaking wooden table, but about how he didn't see Tara's foot on the ropes and all this crap. And the whole story here of this pay-per-view, as much as anything else, was twofold. Was number one... The main event mafia and all their bullshit. And number two, Slick fucking Johnson. That, of course, brings us to the epic encounter. Some main event mafia business, if you will. Charmel versus Jenna Maraska. And this is one of these matches that everybody knows about. Everybody references, even if they haven't seen it. And it is widely considered the worst women's match that anybody has ever seen if not the worst professional wrestling match that anybody has ever seen. And it's usually summed up by this. Minus five stars! Well, I will tell you this. It was terrible. It was horrible. It was brutal in so many different ways. From Charmel saying, fuck it, I'm just going to wrestle in a freaking evening gown to Jenna Maraska with that total skank-ass stripper entrance into the ring, whatever the hump that dry-humping shit was, to 
the brutality of just how bad this match was to watch visually, especially when Jenna Maraska started throwing them vicious freaking slaps that made no contact. Then at one point in time, when Soljo bolts up on the ropes and she gets hit off, Kong just basically kind of catches her, but just lets her drop the fucking ground. You can see the look on Kong's face the entire time. She's like, fuck this shit. And that's right, fuck this shit. And it looked like at the end, Jenna Maraska wanted Charmel to fuck that shit, meaning her cunt, with Charmel's tongue. What the hell was that face-sitting finish? The only glory that came out of this was Kong sitting there and splashing Marask at the very end. This is one of these things where you bring in some C-list type of celebrity and you try to make it into something much more than it actually is, like people are going to care way more than they actually do. There is no payoff to this. Nothing good can really come from it. And this is exactly what you got. And when you watch this, you see just how bad and dumb some of the ideas that TNA had for the people that brought in from the mainstream world. And this was a brutal match. It was bad. It was terrible. I spent the entire time laughing, not because it was enjoyable, not because it was any fucking good, because it was oh so bad. However, with that said, it is not the worst women's match I've ever seen. It is most certainly not the worst wrestling match that I've ever seen. It's not even close. It's not even the worst match I've seen in TNA history. Not even close. This is one of these instances where somebody says, minus five stars, and everybody buys it and everybody believes it. I promise you, there are matches that are much, much worse than this. See Sting and Jeff Hardy two years later. That's all I'm saying. Kevin Nash versus AJ Styles, Legends Championship at stake, a.k.a. a real feud over a fake fucking title. Just think about that for a second. And in 2009 TNA, what we're doing with AJ Styles, the phenomenal one, the one true franchise player, the real true, no offense to Matt Morgan, the real true DNA of TNA, the identity of TNA, to where even if people shit on the company and hate the company and this and that, AJ Styles was the one guy that kind of metamorphosized outside of that box to where people said, well, at least they had AJ Styles, or at least AJ Styles is worth a shit. But in 2009, we weren't trying to hear that at this point in time. It's Kevin Nash, AJ Styles, real feud over a fake fucking title. And what did you think was going to happen here? (laughs) And honestly, in terms of the match, what more did you expect from Nash at this stage of his career? His body's broken and beaten down, and you could clearly see, based off the way he conducted himself, he was just there for a paycheck. He even went to going to talking about that he was in it for the money, and clearly, based off of so much of what happened in 2009 with Kevin Nash, you can clearly say he was just there for the money. Um, At the time, it was horrendous to think that Kevin Nash going over AJ Styles in the manner that it did happen too, where AJ did all of this and all of that, and then Kevin Nash catches him one time and it's over. It's like, oh, bullshit, give me a fucking break. But now, with the benefit of history, knowing what happened in the following months, by 2009's conclusion, AJ Styles was the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. So you got the fake belt off him and put the real most important title in the company on him. Looking back now, this match isn't that bad in terms of the finish, in terms of the consequences. It's still like, come on, and it wasn't any good, but it doesn't piss me off as much as it did eight years ago. After this, blonde bitch number five, whatever the hell her name was, I can't remember, and it doesn't matter. Was it Lauren? Who gives a shit? For some reason, she's taking a microphone and a live camera into the knockouts locker room because that inherently seems like a good idea. To which then, of course, here comes one of the two most important people of the night, freaking Slick Johnson, coming out of the knockout shower and closely followed by Madison Rain. To which everybody wonders what's going on here. To which I would have said back then and still say now, why, oh why, was Slick Johnson in the shower at Universal Studios Orlando with Madison Rain? <laughs> They have laws against that, sir. It's called bestiality. Steiner and Booker T versus Beer Money for the TNA Tag Team Championship. 
Now, I knew because of what Kurt Angle has said earlier on in the night, Steiner and Booker weren't going to be fired for the company. So I already knew these guys were going over eight years ago, and it's clearly obvious to see when you go back and watch it now. With that said, there was still some hope back then that this match was going to be a saving grace of this show. You had two teams of people that were very familiar with tag team wrestling, very accomplished as tag team wrestlers. How could this possibly suck? Well, let me tell you. You get a beer spitting spot from James Storm where Earl Hebner is nowhere near the beer actually being spit. He gets tapped and then all of a sudden he's wiping his eyes like this beer is stinging him like nobody's fucking business. How the fuck did he get beer in his eyes when he was literally like three or four feet away from the actual (laughs) residual of this beer spray? And then in particular, when we get to the fucking finish, how is a partially blind Earl Hebner able to beat Storm back into the ring and then on top of that count one, two, three? So not only did Storm reach the ropes first and begin his ascent into the ring, he looks, stops, Earl Hebner is able, partially blinded because of beer that didn't get into his freaky guys, to get into the ring and then count one, two, three before James Storm gets there. And it's only more perfectly topped off by one Steiner is celebrating on the top ropes. He can't even sign main event mafia, right? And then Booker does this shit at this time. I don't know what the hell this was. The gayest pose I think I've ever seen Booker or any other professional wrestler make. Moa Joe versus Sting. You sit there and you watch and you wonder... Why did Samoa Joe ever have this tribal crap on his eye? Why did we sit there and try to pretend like this was an actual permanent tattoo when it would come off halfway through the match? Who knows? Who fucking cares? Just like we don't care about the fact that this was a standard professional wrestling match, but of course these guys are going out in the crowd and fighting all over the impact zone, and it doesn't matter because who cares about the rules of professional wrestling? And the whole buildup of this match was ultimately all about the... TNA debut of Taz like this already hadn't been completely spoiled in previous weeks with the graphics Samoa Joe using the rear naked choke showing FTW showing the number 13 everybody knew it was freaking Taz at least I can say this when Taz came out you played off of it in terms of the match but Taz didn't get too involved Samoa Joe and Sting still finished their match and did it right and at least I will say this the former main event mafia member Sting tapped out for the new main event mafia member Samoa Joe but again knowing that Samoa Joe had his mentor debuting and Kurt Angle had said earlier in the night that if you lose you're fired you already knew what the hell was going to happen why would you care and why would you want to watch and of course we close out the night with the main event for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship Mick Foley versus Kurt Angle And if you had listened to Kurt Angle early in the night, he tried to warn you this wasn't going to be any good. It was frankly going to suck. And it was Mick Foley main eventing a wrestling pay-per-view in 2009. How do you think it went? It was bad. It was awkward. You're looking at two guys at this time. Mick Foley looks like a beaten, broken down shell of his former self. And frankly, Kurt Angle looks like a weird kind of pedo, broken down, drugged up version of his former self. This match was bad on so many different levels. This is one of these examples of, oh, we brought in Mick Foley from WWE. Got to shoehorn him right into the main event scene. Got to make a world champion. Got to have him feud with Kurt Angle over the title. At least Kurt Angle won here. And then you get the big main event mafia celebration at the end of it. And I'm sorry. I know some older TNA fans liked the main event Mafia. I thought it was a complete steaming pile of shit. I hated so many things about the main event Mafia storyline. I hated how it was booked, how it was written, how the storyline arc progressed. I hated all of it. And frankly, it did what so often happens when you put some of these veterans in a top spot. You end up elevating nobody, including themselves. Now, I would kill for a main event mafia type of storyline in today's company with global farce wrestling. But back in 2009, this was terrible. And what was really terrible about all of this when it comes to the main event mafia is within a few months, especially once Hogan and Bischoff came in the fold in January 2010, it was basically like you forgot this shit ever fucking happened. 
There was no payoff to any of this. There was no glory to making new stars out of this because, again, none of that shit happened. AJ eventually got the world title, and that's cool. But really, with all of this, it just left Samoa Joe kind of blowing in the freaking breeze. And ultimately, it feels like you just utilized him in this main event mafia storyline to introduce your future color commentator for the next several fucking years. The main event mafia sucked, period. I don't hate the guys that were in it. I just hate what the faction was and how it was done because it was shit in my opinion. And this show was shit. Worst pay-per-view of all time? Absolutely not. Worst TNA pay-per-view of all time? Absolutely not. Worst TNA pay-per-view of 2009? Debatable, to say the very least. But I can assure you of this. For every one of you that suggested this, for every one of you that voted for this, I hate you, and I hate you with the passion, and fuck you. Hopefully next time, we can actually get a decent show for me to review because this was was a steaming pile of crap. Because ultimately, Russo's gonna Russo.